Christ is risen. We are so blessed to serve a risen Savior who died for our sin, rested in the grave on the Sabbath day, and was raised again on the third day. And it's good to celebrate it, good to ponder it. I invite you maybe through this um, Sabbath evening to, to read part of the Desire of Ages that are connected with these tremendous events in history that divides not just our history in half, but the whole universe as well, as Christ died for us. So, uh, but today we will study the book of Ruth, and we'll finish the study here in this book. And I invite you to bow your heads um, with me one more time as we open it up. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for opportunity to be here to worship you, to open our hearts and give you praise and glory. And we ask also that you will pour out your Holy Spirit in our hearts, that as we open your word, we'll be again transformed by it. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Susan ran into her old classmate, Jackie. And they talked a little bit. It was good to catch up together and uh, share the, their stories, what they're doing. So Susan found out that Jackie is now working in management in ADRA. She's helping um, to, to organize uh, all the um, things that, that are going on behind the scene to transport water and food and medicine to the areas in the world that desperately need it. So by Jackie's efforts and talents, millions of people are helped around the world and see the grace of God and his care more. So they parted ways, and Susan was so excited for Jackie, for what she was doing in this world, for the impact that she had through her work to touch so many people around the world. But also she started thinking about her life and reflecting on her life. She got a degree from college herself, but now she's staying at home and taking care of her two-year-old Tommy. He's quite a handful, so she take, he takes most of her time as they're at home and she's taking care of him. She also takes quite a bit of time to go to her mother who is elderly and helps her around the house and get the grocery and do some cooking for her and help her out. She helps her neighbors around the street who also need some help. But it seems like her impact is very small compared to what Jackie is doing with her life. And she is wondering... Is she's wondering, is that all she can do with her life? Is that the biggest impact that she can bring for God's kingdom is just a little work that she's doing at home and with her neighbors? Do you wonder that sometimes too? How can you make a bigger impact for God's life, for God's kingdom through your life? Is what you're doing enough in the area that God has given you, or should you strive for something bigger? Well, with that question ringing in our ears, I invite you to again study the book of Ruth. After dozens of hours, probably approaching to hundreds of studying this book, it really became one of my favorites. The way that it is written, the way that it opens up, the deeper that we go into it, the way that we see the character of God, it's really an amazing book. It's a story of death and dis disappointment, of shared dreams, lost hope, of loneliness and bitterness. But this story is also the story of people like Ruth and Naomi and Boaz who do has said. Remember that word that we studied that there's not quite accurate translation that we can find in English, but it means that special Hebrew word that means loving kindness, covenant relationship, unselfishness, mercy. All of that is in that word hasad. Because they do hasad, they are under the wings of God, 
And those who are under the wings of God, God can easily move and, and uh, put in the right place in the right time in order for his purpose to come through. So he moves in this story, and there's lots of lessons that we have already learned in this story. If you have missed any, I invite you to go to our YouTube channel and watch those number one, two, and three. But last time we left the story when the two widows acted, acted to give the proposal to Boaz for marriage so that Boaz will marry Ruth. But despite the feeling of love towards Ruth, he has to do what is right, what is honorable thing, according to the laws of their land. So there's a closest relative, closer than he, and he wants to give that relative, as he's opposed to, an option of redeeming um, them first. So we are left wondering again, what will happen? So in chapter 4, we see now Boaz takes initiative. People of God, they don't just sit on the sidelines. They take initiative, and they want to make sure that they're in the will of God, that God is guiding them. But once they have that clear, they take initiative and they act. We see in chapter 2, it is Ruth who takes action. She goes into the fields and gleans the crops. In chapter 3, it is now Naomi who who is renewed with hope and vigor, comes up with the plan of the proposal and, and uh, encourages Ruth towards action. And now in chapter 4, it is Boaz who takes now actions and moves with the Spirit of God. So let's pick up the story if you open your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4. Uh, hopefully by the next uh, Sabbath, thank you, A.V., for working on, on that. We'll have the screen fixed. But for now, you can open your Bibles and Ruth chapter 4, and we will uh, start with verse 1. Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, a close relative from Boaz had, uh, uh, had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Bide back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then, then tell me that I may know, for there is no, other, no, no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, we have been waiting this whole time. We have been cheering for who? For Boaz and Ruth. <laughs> So it seems like everything was falling into place. They had quite, quite uh, um, many barriers along the way. And now it comes to this moment and he says he will redeem it. <laughs> so we are disappointed. We are left in suspense again. Is it not going to work out after all our hopes have been built up? So we see that God is still acting. He still brings the circumstances and people as in the previous chapter, we have been reading, it happened, it happened, it happened. But we know that God was bringing it together. So even here we read, the close relative was walking by. Behold, you know, here he is. The one that Boaz was looking for. So he is here. And it's interesting to note also, as we are reading through this verse 1, that the name of close relative is not mentioned. Although Boaz most likely calls him by name, the author deliberately doesn't give the name to us, and we'll see later on why. In most of the translation, it uses the word friend, but then it has an asterisk on top. Translators try to put some nice word to make it smooth for, the, for us to read. But if you go down and look, what does it refer to? What does your Bible say? So-and-so. 
Yeah, that's the closest English translation that we can come up with. So and so. One translation suggested John Doe. <laughs> well, it's definitely Boaz didn't call him by so and so or John Doe, he called him by the name. But the author deliberately leaves his name out, and we will find out a little bit later why. And they're there by the gate. It's important things happen by the gate. It's kind of um, um, central square in some places. So in, in Jerusalem and in Judea and that area, things happen by the gate. Important meetings, judgment, things like that. So there by the gate, he calls the elders um, so to make sure that everything is done according to, to the laws of that time. So can you imagine this relative going about his business, you know, ate his breakfast, going to work, and all of a sudden pull into court? <laughs> And important decisions need to be made right there. There's a proposal about land, marriage, and he needs to decide right there what he's going to do. So I feel kind of bad for him having to decide right there on the spot. So he... Um, but it becomes also evident that for him, neither that morning nor the mornings before, he didn't really care or was concerned about helping out Naomi or Ruth being the closest relative that he was. And then the issue of redeeming the land comes up. There, for his um, closest relative to Elimelech, um, not clear if the land already been sold by Elimelech or Ruth has, uh, or Naomi sold it, but we know that by the laws that they had, so they would not really sell it. They would kind of, a uh, person would pay money, but then until the year of Jubilee, then at the year of Jubilee, it will be returned to the family if there was any family. So close relative is called, but not required to redeem. And if they are able to, they are called to redeem even before the year of Jubilee. So for the named relative of, Elim of Elimelech, it's a pretty good uh, proposition that he hears. So there's two options for him. If he does not do anything, since he is the closest relative, at the year of Jubilee, that land will become basically his inheritance. It will become his land, part of his lineage, and part of his um, family now. If he redeems it now, we don't know how many years till the year of Jubilee. You know, it could be 30, 40 years. So if he redeems it now, maybe he'll get enough crop now that the, the crop is coming in, so the drought is over, he can get enough, so he will be in the positive and will be able to recoup his money pretty soon. So it's a pretty good for him in uh, either way. But now Boaz reminds him that if he really cares for his brother, he also needs to, to care for the lineage and the name of his brother to be redeemed. For Elimelech and also even closer for Malon, for the son of Elimelech. So we continue to read as Boaz speaks in verses 5 through 7. Ruth chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Then Boaz said, on, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the confirmation in Israel. So now Boaz reveals what is really on his heart, and that is Ruth, and to take care of Ruth and Naomi. And the closest relative also reveals what's on his heart and his character. So the named relative, he will do the 
honorable thing, but as long as it's good for him. In other words, what's in it for me? This relative says, it will hurt my own inheritance, my own lineage, if I will do this how you are proposing, the right way, the full way. In which way will it hurt his lineage? Well, there's also two, two different variations. We don't know exactly what's going on in his family, but basically, if he, if he marries Ruth and they will have a child, then this child will not carry his name, but will carry the name of Elimelech. And that land that he paid to redeem now will go not with the lineage of his name, but with the name of Elimelech, and the land will go uh, to, to that lineage. So it won't be his. And another option, and probably might be what's happening here, if he doesn't have the firstborn yet himself, then not only will the son of Ruth inherit all the land of Elimelech that he pays to redeem, but also even the portion of his own land will go over to the lineage of Elimelech. So he says, he says no, I will not do it. It's not good for me. It's not good for my name. For my lineage. The relative is concerned in preserving his own name and therefore backs out quickly. It's ironic, isn't it? And the irony is that, that in the effort to preserve his own name, he loses an opportunity to be known through the rest of the history of the world and purposely left out unnamed in the book of Ruth, becomes John Doe, so-and-so. <laughs> then in verse 9 and 10, we see the conclusion of the exchange as Boaz gives his, um, his, his proposition to redeem the land, to marry Ruth, to restore the name of the Malon through the firstborn. Then the first section of the business part is over in chapter 4, and the blessing starts to flow first from the elders there, there on the gate, the blessing of Rachel and Leah of Perez, blessing of great offspring and well-known names. Now that also starts to speed up. First, we were moving quite slow through all the chapters. Now he starts to speed up, and just in one verse, he covers the whole year. So let's, let's read together that section, Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. It reads, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And, they, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has bore him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and, and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So we see the story is not that much about Ruth, but even about Naomi. For she is restored now, her hands are full now. She lost everything, husband, both children, no grandchildren, lost all the land, was poor, came empty-handed, as we read in Ruth chapter 1, verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. But now God brought restoration through Ruth, through Boaz, through the new life, through the Redeemer, through God's has said, and those who do God's has said to others. 
Remember that word that has said that is used in the Bible two-thirds of the time is used when God has said for us and one-third when we have said also for each other. It was God who orchestrated everything. It was God who brought harvest to Bethlehem. It was God who opened the womb of Ruth after 10 years of barrenness, and she instantly became pregnant. It was God who fills us with his has said and with his grace and with his redemption. And then the author speeds up even faster and goes through genealogy and shows how this story even more glorious than we could ever imagine. And he goes through the genealogy of ten generations, placing Boaz the seventh, give, giving him the honor, and also goes all the way to King David that came from that lineage as well. And God wants us to learn a lesson here. Did you notice how the book was started? Significant speed, just in few verses, 20, 30 years are covered just in the introduction verses. Then it takes very slow pace. Basically, most of the book takes just two months, and most of that time is dedicated just to four days. The day that they came back to Bethlehem, the day that Ruth went out to glean in the field, the day of the proposal, and the day of judgment by the gate. Most of the time is dedicated just to a few days, four days. And then he starts to speed up again. In just one verse, he covers the whole year. And then in the very end, he covers ten generations. So be careful, buckle up, or you'll get a whiplash. It takes, it takes off in a hyperspeed. Is it just a way to tell the story? Or is it significant why he frames it? in such a way. He's also trying to say something to us. Maybe what he's trying to say is that the events of daily lives of ordinary people, but those who reflect the character of God and do has said to others, show kindness, love and care and loyalty is never insignificant. And the impact is much more than participants will be able to recognize even in this life. In other words, ordinary people doing ordinary things while reflecting God's character will always come to extraordinary results. The author shows the big spectrum of history, then zooms in, zooms in just to four days. See, you might think that the life is simple life, every daily routine. Actions are insignificant, but with God, it is very significant and turns the history as well. When Ruth decided to show this Hasad her kindness towards the widow Naomi, that's all she wanted to do. That's all she committed herself to doing. Just taking care of the widow in the strange land to her. She didn't think to change the history. She could not have predicted that God will bring these plans together that he will bring Boaz, give her a child, give Naomi a grandson, and even in her lineage she, be, she will become the mother of the greatest king of Israel and even the mother of, uh, the, in the lineage of Christ himself. Ordinary people doing ordinary things while reflecting God's character will always come to extraordinary results. So we leave the book of Ruth, but let us not forget the lessons of the book of Ruth. And even if we start stepping away from this chapter, let us look again at what author wants us to pay attention to, of just ordinary people doing ordinary things in daily lives, but reflecting his character, bring extraordinary results 
As we step away from the last chapter of the book of Ruth, the whole book comes into view and we see great restoration, restoration of Ruth, but a special restoration to Naomi. God works in all circumstances, no matter how small, and we trust Him as we continue to reflect His character in our daily tasks. We take a second step back and now we have a larger view and we see King David also come to the throne. How different our Bibles would be. How different the history will be. How different our children's story will be if we didn't have King David in the Bible. We see that God has used him to bring Hasad to the whole nation. The whole story of Israel is impacted, becomes different because ordinary people while reflecting God's character, will always come to extraordinary results. We step back a little bit further, and now we see in the history Jesus come into play. And we know that although David would not have been born, Jesus would still be born, but we see so many parallels through the story of Boaz and Christ himself. Like Boaz, he invites us to eat with him, to commune with him, to spend this time together. Like Boaz, he longs for us to come into the covenant with him. Like Boaz, he goes into the judgment and intercede on our behalf so he can redeem us and restore us. Then we take another step back and see the whole Bible now in view from the very beginning as God has created everything perfect and now sin comes into play and we have fallen and not worthy to be called his children anymore. But then he restores everything in the very end. He brings that restoration and every day he continues to be involved with us and every day matters. And even everyday tasks matter. And now we step the final step back. And now beyond the Bible authors, we see ourselves in the picture, in the history of this world. And we wonder, we wonder, does anything we do in this world, does it matter? Does it matter? All Ruth was doing... All she committed herself to doing is taking care of one widow unselfishly. But by God's guidance, became part of the lineage of the king, part of the lineage of Christ. So no matter what we do, as long as we continue to reflect his character, makes an impact for the kingdom of God to come. And also... Also, looking at this story, we see that lineage is very important. Looking all through the Bible, we see that lineage is important. And before Christ's birth, Christ chose very carefully who would be in his lineage. He didn't choose Orpah. He didn't choose unnamed relative, although none of them did anything wrong. None of them broke any commandments, as we see. All of them did what was right uh, what was uh, within their rights. But God chose those who reflected his character and showed Hassad to others. We live in the era already after Christ's birth. But God continues to choose just as carefully who would be part of his family here on earth, who will continue his lineage here on earth for eternity to come. And he chooses carefully and he set out the criteria for us, how he will graft people in to his family to live for eternity. In John chapter 1, verse 11, we read this verse. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Not everybody has that right to be grafted into his family. Not everybody is called the child of God, although the invitation is for everybody. But for those who 
accept him into their lives. For those who believe in his name, accept them into their lives deep enough that it starts reflecting through everything that they do, through every day task, through every circumstance. And they become grafted into his family. And don't try to preserve your name on this earth. Live the legacy for your own name or it will be forgotten like that of the unnamed relative. Instead, like Boaz, preserve the name of Christ by your words, your deeds, your life, and your name will be heard by the whole universe from the mouth of the prince himself. As Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Christ himself will pronounce your name. And we will become part of the family of God, just like Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17, we read, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. God invites us to become part of the lineage. Just as he invited Ruth and Boaz, he invites us to be grafted into his family. So by his spirit, we are adopted. By the way that we live this life together with him, we will suffer, will endure by his strength. And together with him, we will be glorified when he comes soon. So coming back to our story of Susan, who takes care of her little Tommy, her elderly mother, and some neighbors. Is that insignificant? What would you tell her? What would you say to yourself? Well, the author of Ruth, together with God, wants to shout it into your life that ordinary people Doing ordinary things while reflecting God's character will always come to extraordinary results. And some of them will not realize on this side of heaven. Amen. Let's stand while we sing number 623, I Will Follow Thee.
Satan, even by closest disciples, you took up the cross for us, that you died for us in order to redeem us, in order to graft us into your family. And now we ask that you will draw us close to yourself, that whatever we do, whether it's great things that everybody can see or just ordinary daily tasks that you call us to do, may we do it all for your glory with your kindness and love in our hearts towards others. May your love flow through us. May everything we do will reflect you. And soon you will call us to your kingdom as your children. We are so thankful that you have adopted us into your family already and that we can call you Abba. Please bless each person here. Bless us for the rest of the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed Sabbath. <laughs>